You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the Telegraph's deputy political editor Lucy Fisher. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. You're just so fuelish. The Metro leads with Transport Secretary Grant Schatz blaming the fuel supply crisis on truckers and drivers for panic buying. Shambles is how the mirror describes the chaos at petrol stations. While the sun warns of a panic Monday as drivers trade punches in the queue for fuel. The Star claims some petrol stations have hiked prices as motorists queue outside. Boris Johnson is set to meet ministers tomorrow to decide on whether to call in the army to tackle the crisis that's on the front of The Guardian. And that's also the lead story in The Times, which reports the move is likely. The Telegraph has the same story. As we wait for the full results of the German elections, the Frankfurter Allgemeine has this headline, SPD and CDU claim leadership. Schultz and Leschet want to form a government. The Mail reports on technical issues on smart motorways, claiming one in ten vital safety cameras aren't working. And the Financial Times understands the government intends to lower the salary threshold at which graduates start paying back student loans. So with me tonight, Steve Richards and Lucy Fisher. Welcome to you both. Good evening. Let's start with the Times and uh, the, the story there that the army is to be called in to help the government tackle the, the fuel crisis. Uh, let's hear from you first of all, Steve. Well, it's, uh, you know, if in doubt, send for the army. There are clear lines of command and control with the army. But it seems to me that all these measures that we've heard over the last 24 hours, including the U-turn over uh, visas for 5,000 drivers, none of them uh, address the scale of the challenge, which is a shortage of around 130,000 drivers, is it? Some, on well, 100,000 or whatever. Um, uh, arising from a number of issues, including Brexit and the shortage of East Europeans who are here, and it's applying to many sectors. Um, so this might help with the sort of short term. But when people sort of accuse, and there are headlines about it, which we're coming to, you know, panic buying and all the rest of it, well, you can sort of understand the reason why people are panicking. I know there's enough fuel around, but if there aren't drivers to deliver it, they're not going to get to the petrol stations. And um, it seems to me that this is going to run for quite some time. It's not a short-term issue that's going to be solved by the army. Yes, and it's, uh, it's very easy to tell people to, to not panic. But when the, the figures tell us that up to 90% of petrol stations have run dry, um, that, that is worrying. Well, that's right. It is rather a futile uh, warning that we've heard from Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary and others. Um, clearly, it's fallen on deaf ears. Today, we've heard reports of fights at petrol stations as desperate uh, motorists um, barge each other, trying to get the last of the petrol at the pumps. Uh, 5,500 petrol stations out of Britain's 8,000 uh, may have run out of petrol, according to the upper estimates put forward by industry bodies. Some forecourts have put a ban on people buying any more than £30 worth of petrol at once. So it's been another day of, of scenes. And I think the Transport Secretary's uh, broadcast round on Sky and other media organisations this morning perhaps didn't strike quite the wisest tone. He um, sought to uh, apportion blame to the Road Hauliers Association, suggesting that leaks from a private government meeting um, warnings from BP had precipitated the panic buying rather than perhaps taking ownership of some of the longer term problems with the HGV driver crisis, which has been coming down the line for some time now. Um, we look at The Guardian and in, in the detail of, of their story, um, they're saying that this operation called o Operation Escalin, it was conceived years ago during the planning for a no-deal Brexit and would involve the drafting of hundreds of soldiers to drive a reserve fleet of, of 80 tankers. So it seems as if it's something that, that has been planned for, although we don't seem to be in a situation um, that suggests it's been planned for at all, Steve. <laughs> 
Well, the no deal Brexit, uh, Boris Johnson said Britain was going to flourish in such a context, but clearly there were plans for a crisis on the scale uh, that we're now experiencing. The, the issue again, it seems to me, is that, yeah, great that 80 vessels will be driven around, presumably targeting different areas. Um, but the scale of this is is much bigger. And to be honest, I, I had quite a long journey yesterday. I went to a petrol station and the woman who served me was hilarious Said everyone's right. It's wrong to panic and right to panic. She, that station was about to run out um, with long queues um, because if you get the sense of shortage, what are you going to do if you're dependent on a car, as many people are for work and all the rest of it? So you can see how... Uh, it feeds on itself. And as I say, it doesn't seem to me that any of the measures announced so far address the scale of the thing. And it was predicted, it was predicted during the Brexit referendum that there would be shortages on this scale. And as you suggest, the government was preparing for something like this in the event of a no deal. But given the nature of Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, uh, there was always going to be this issue Anyway, uh, we're out of all the deals that used to encourage people to come here. Um, and it's great, as ministers are saying, that wages are going up. But that will not tackle the short-term issue of uh, demand and supply. Uh, Lucy, what about the, the tactic of the, the Competition Act being temporarily relaxed to allow oil companies to target petrol stations running low on, on fuel? In the short term, is that the, the best road forward? Well, it feels like one small cog in, in the, the greater uh, plan, or at least the, of what's needed here, one piece of that puzzle. Um, clearly, it makes sense in the short-term acute phase of the crisis um, to allow companies to share information, to share resources, uh, perhaps if there are vehicles going to the same region or local area, um, to work together. But I think, as Steve has made clear, there doesn't appear so far to be a sustainable long-term plan here. When you look at the government's move uh, in, in recent days, the U-turn to um, allow uh, visas for foreign HGV truck drivers up to 5,000 before Christmas, well, that's only a drop in the ocean of how many are needed. There's also a lot of concern that, in fact, there's an HGG, HGV driver shortage across Europe. So it's not even clear that there will be people from the continent wanting to come to Britain to do this. And at the moment, of course, all the focus is on fuel. But there are also concerns about other um, sectors, particularly supermarkets, um, that are seeing increasing shortages. I think as the winter continues, uh, we'll see this crisis bite potentially further, particularly in the run-up to Christmas with people looking to get the products, parents especially wanting the toys uh, and latest gadgets for their children. This could spell a lot of political problems for the Conservatives. The Mirror, their headline, shambles. And again, they're, they're suggesting that the Prime Minister knew about this impending crisis. He was warned about it back in, in June, but, but did nothing. Um, and their piece is saying that this could last for at least another 10 days. Yeah, I wouldn't well, I think be surprised. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you Steve, go, go ahead. Steve, go ahead. Well, just very quickly, yeah, I, 10 days minimum, it seems to me, um, because, you know, there are longer term implications here and there are patterns of uh, Boris Johnson being warned about possible uh, eruptions or crises and, and not acting when there was some sort of time to do so. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this will be a problem for uh, uh, 10 days seems to me the best we can hope for but let, let's hope it isn't more than that. Lucy come in. I think well I think Steve's right and when we're looking at the plans that are being put forward in the papers today that the government is said to be considering hundreds of soldiers could be scrambled to be involved in driving this reserve fleet of 80 tankers but it's thought that many of them may already be on deployment so that will take up to several weeks to implement that plan as those um, soldiers are, are clawed back from whatever they're doing at the moment again with the visa uh, solution it could be up to several weeks until those visas um, are successfully handed out to to foreign drivers so again in the very short term, some of the measures announced won't take effect immediately. Okay. It's also the case that it's a very lofty invitation to these drivers. You know, come over, we'll give you a visa, but we were kicking you out again on Christmas Eve. I mean, I wonder how many are going to take up this uh, invitation. Have a look now at the Financial Times and uh, their coverage of the German 
elections. It is incredibly close, much closer than many were predicting, Lucy. Um, are you surprised by that? Well, in a sense, no. It's been a, a very unpredictable election. Up to a third of voters uh, said that they were unsure going into the polls. Uh, we've seen the polls switch both ways uh, in the months leading up to this ballot. We saw at the beginning Merkel's uh, Christian Democrat Party in the lead. At one point, the Green Party was in the lead. And then, of course, there was the late surge for the Social Democrats, According to two exit polls tonight, it looks like the Social Democrats may have just edged it to be the largest party with predictions they've got between 25 to 26 percent of the vote. But that's only one percentage point ahead of the Christian Democrats on 24 to 25 percent. Of course, we need to wait till the votes are counted. But uh, it's all looking on a knife edge, very exciting and lots of talk of a three way coalition, which could potentially take months to flesh out. Yes, yeah, very close to call. Unusual for, for German politics, Steve. Yeah, and it's so different to our own, isn't it? It's interesting that um, we are now going to see in Germany this sort of negotiation possibly lasting, as Lucy suggests, for a long time before a new government is formed. With our system, where in theory you have two parties with very broad coalitions between within each of the two parties, and one tends to win. But in our, our system sort of breaking down now, they're, they're not so much broad coalitions with leaders feeling obliged to take on one wing or another. Um, whereas in Germany now you have sort of in a way a more transparent process where different parties stand and on the basis of the votes then negotiate a partnership rather than our system here where two theoretical broad coalitions stand. Lucy, let's go to the Times um, and uh, Angela Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour Party, pictured there. Um, no real apologies in sight. No, she has stood firm today, despite being uh, rebuked by uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader. He's made it clear that uh, her remarks last night at the first day of Labour conference, where she uh, referred to senior Conservatives as scum, uh, he made it clear that that is not language that he would have used and that he would be having a word with her. Some of his other uh, front bench colleagues went further. Lucy Powell, the shadow housing secretary, made clear she thought that Angela Rayner had overstepped the mark and should make clear that she had caused offence and, and regretted that. Um, but Angela Rayner herself uh, used uh, the row and the conversation provoked over this to draw attention to some of the controversial things the prime minister said. She said that she'd apologise for calling the Conservatives scum when he apologised uh, for making remarks that she characterised as being homophobic, racist and misogynistic. So all in all, it's been a lot of recriminations hurled between both parties. But uh, I think on both sides, there have been uh, Labour front benches and certainly members of the Conservative government who think that this sort of language is not conducive to a respectful Lucy. debate. Uh, and Lucy, thank you. We have uh, run out of time.